the New Zealand Business Podcast, brought to you by Guerrilla Technology, your strategic and proactive IT partner. Welcome along to the New Zealand Business Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Spain. As a futurist and business owner, I often say that the first part of looking into the future is looking into the past. Today, we're going to do exactly that. As we prepare ourselves and think about how we can do better going forwards, and that's really what the New Zealand Business Podcast is about, to, to learn from others, uh, to grow and develop ourselves. Our guest today is Dr. Paul Woodfield. He comes from a family wine growing heritage. His great grandparents founded Corbin's Wines in the early 1900s, which grew to be one of the largest wine businesses in New Zealand, and ultimately was pivotal in catapulting the local wine industry to become a key export earner for New Zealand. Coming from a family of innovators in business, Paul has put a huge focus on entrepreneurship and innovation, uh, particularly in family businesses, traditional industries, and science for technological innovation. Uh, today, he is a senior lecturer at Auckland University of Technology. The New Zealand Business Podcast is brought to you by Guerrilla Technology, providers of managed information technology and cybersecurity services for small to medium New Zealand organisations. Well, without further ado, let's jump mm -hmm. in. Uh, Paul, great to have you on the show. Yes, thank you very much. And I, I mean, I, I'm scaling back to 2013 or somewhere where and I remember watching one of your first uh, podcasts at that time and thinking, well, we've crossed paths a number of times since then, but um, it's pretty exciting that you know we're almost a decade on or over a decade on almost and yeah. still doing it. It's great. Yeah, yeah. well, thanks for, thank thank, for having thanks for coming in. Uh, you know, very, very keen to uh, learn more about your journey and, yeah. you know, particularly the, the research and so on uh, that you've done. I think folks will, will find that um, fascinating, but maybe we can we can start out at the beginning, uh, you know, where, where, where you grew up in New Zealand and, uh, you know, where your journey journey began. Absolutely. So I was I was born here in Auckland, but um, we moved pretty quickly down to Southland. So we spent uh, my formative years really in uh, the depths of South. Uh, for about eight years, uh, spending about a year in Christchurch as well, and then making the big move up to uh, the Bay of Islands. So quite a difference, well, a big change from uh, being down in small town uh, Southland to uh, small town Bay of Islands. Uh, and, you know, from there it was more that I got through all my schooling, did that, and then thought, hey, I need to do some study and uh, started looking at what I could do. I'd always had an interest in uh, architecture, and uh, part of moving from from the thoughts around you know design and drawings and so on, what would what would be another part of the industry that I might be interested in? And quantity surveying came up, and uh, so, so I ended up doing a, a course in that. Okay, so that was your that was your sort of start on the on the education and yep. uh, you know work ladder as it as it were. Yep. Um, so what did that look like? Where did where did you study and yep. How did you get from study into uh, you know into the into the workforce? What did that journey look like? So you know, after leaving school, I'd say uh, certain grades weren't the, the the best for maybe going into the construction industry. But what I found when I was paying for it was I was you know studying it, um, I was really engaged. So a subject like physics, for instance, so I was like, well, this is applicable now. I can I can utilize this. So. You know, um, I was studying at what is now called uh, Unitech and, and uh, finished off over a period of time uh, uh, the diploma in quantity surveying at the Open Polytechnic um, eventually. Uh, the reason why eventually is because I uh, was finishing off an assignment, got it done early, thought, hey, there's free pizzas at an institute meeting. I might go and see what that's about and uh, turned up and uh, ended up talking to one of the directors of a consulting firm. And he uh, kind of said, well, you know, do, you're the only student here. Let's have a chat about where where you want to go. And and uh, so in the midst of my study, he he kind of said, well, you know, um, let's let's have a chat on Monday and 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 go from there. Right. So you you basically got in, uh, got across from studying actually into the into the sector. Um, you know, quicker quicker than most because you were uh, you know uh, interested in pizza and. I guess probably a little bit more than <laughs> more than more than the pizza. I'm sure. Yeah, of course. Um, I'm just for that. Know, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and and you know, really taking an interest in 
and what was happening in the industry yeah. and and uh, you know attending that industry event. not everything helps as well i mean you know <laughs> you know it's one of those things where you think well um what's this institute thing well i didn't i didn't know anything about us coming from small towns as i've you know, outlined but i mean yeah, yeah, the yeah. uh going to this institute meeting meant that these people were future employers I didn't go in there thinking, hey, I'm going to get a job out of this. But what it did do is open my eyes to a way of thinking that I've used, I guess, throughout my career. It's like, hang, hang on, sometimes you just need to turn up. And we'll get into it later, I guess. But entrepreneurship is a, is a bit like that. It's, it's about the turning up and being in places, timing comes into it and so on. So uh, using that as an example, uh, going from from – Working for a firm that was uh, a consulting firm in the in the, uh, the construction industry, I ended up in different facets of the industry. So I spent a good, uh, let's say, five years or so uh, at that firm, uh, working in all sorts of types of jobs, like apartment buildings, office buildings, and smaller jobs, the residential and so on. But um, but also working in uh, jobs that sometimes are a little bit uh, had gone sour. Let's say a developer had gone into uh, got in, got into a bit of trouble, and they. Um, needed to uh, to get things back on track, and, and as a consulting quantity surveyor, um, the, the well, I should say, the firm got involved in in helping uh, get getting them out of the uh, out of the quagmire, you might say, um, and not from a, a financial perspective, but I'm managing the process, um, and you, sometimes it goes as far as a liquidation, but often it was a, a, maybe a moratorium or just getting um, getting the, the the project back on track. So that um, clients would uh, end up with with you know getting their money at the end of the day, uh, but putting that aside, the um, I was seconded to a construction company. I worked there for for a bit. Uh, worked on some of the first apartments uh, down in the, uh, the the waterfront area, um, and at that time also uh, segued into going. Okay, well I've I've been on the construction site with the. 80 ton crane or whatever it is behind me and and had that experience of the fast paced industry as it is uh, and ended up working for a uh, an engineering firm where uh, it's a different environment. So we're working on airport work and, and infrastructure, stormwater and, and things like that. So quite a different facet. Same thing, title change, cost engineer compared to quantity surveyor. Um, but in a nutshell, that's the journey and part of that journey is that uh, you're not just learning about being a quantity surveyor. I should add, you know, that's the, that's the money side of the building industry in many ways. Yeah. Um, but but also having to do the construction management from time to time, a bit of project management along the way as well um, as as jobs, uh, you know, needed it. Yeah, that um, that whole sort of space working on the. Um you know, working with the the numbers, the dollars and cents, and and sort of uh, you know really, it's is so pivotal to to projects, isn't it? Yeah. And when we look at, I mean, certainly the you know the last the last few years, you know, we've had huge disruption, inflation, and and, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, was that something that you would think about at that time? And was you know, has it always been been a been a part of that work? Because there's a mm. there's a level of you know I think where when you you know take on these projects there's a level of you've got to put that futurist mm. hat on mm -hmm. and actually sort of be thinking out you know what could happen what could change uh, you know the bigger projects that that run you know over many many yep. years or even you know one or two years mm. uh, you know there can be changes during that you know mm. that period of time uh, that can wipe out a project in one way or another if if it's not um, you know, if all those things aren't considered, and of course, you know, no one knows mm -hmm. exactly what's gonna what's gonna happen. Certainly, yeah, you know, we've we've seen a lot of you know, a lot of disruption, mm. uh, you know, with COVID and and with other things that are happening mm. in in sort of the the economy and from a geopolitical aspect, supply chain issues. Mm -hmm. um, that stuff sort of sort of huge, right? Well, I mean, if if I you're touching upon something like it uses a bit of an analogy for entrepreneurship, really. I mean, all of those are variables. I mean, fluctuations and costs and supply chain, you know, having to have lead times for certain things, let's say for marble or, or um, you know, certain materials to be delivered into the country and so on. But, you know, as an, an, an analogy for entrepreneurship, I mean, entrepreneurship at its fundamental meaning is really around uh, undertaking a project. And um, if I look at a construction uh you know, thinking about the procuring the 
procuring the job with the client and so on and then moving forward to the various different design phases until you and then then putting some concrete in the ground or whatever it might be uh, and getting the building started and then eventually building that building and and like I say there's that futurist aspect to what's going on uh, for the building and and sometimes there's revisions and changes and so on but also um and iterations but also you know when you come to the point the building's finished you're handing over the keys to a client or um you know maybe a facilities manager uh, to take over the building and look after it from then on and you know that often happens in in business as well where you know you exit a building you exit a business i should say or you're just handing over uh, over the reins to a, a larger larger business where they've um seen the the, the spoils that you've you've made and and it's uh worth worthwhile for them to purchase to mm -hmm. uh, acquire now at the, the end of that period I think it was 2002 you'd worked across you know consulting mm -hmm contracting engineering roles mm -hmm. what uh you know what did you felt that you would you had learned and how that had really you know positioned you for for the next next steps well what i would say is that the construction industry is extremely dynamic anything can go wrong and it always does and mm. it's very iterative and i think that need for lateral thinking a quantity survey is one of the things they write down about what what you need to have as as a quantity survey is, is that lateral thinking uh thinking on the spot and uh but also just knowing that it is an iterative process construction isn't necessarily linear um so at that point in time i was you know leveraging off knowledge um of of the, the process itself but also uh, i was dabbling with uh a couple of friends around um just some ideas really at that point we'd we kind of put together a project a, a, a product and thought oh we'll sell this and all, all, all the rest of it and it and it went to some degree okay um we we just decided that we had our career paths that we we're going to move on to and it just got me thinking hey look um this entre entrepreneurship thing it was something that i guess was always in the the background of my thinking when i was in the industry uh just the process side of things, but also um, going forward and thinking about the, um, I guess the, uh, well, the, 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 the fact that you need to um, uh, think about what a business looks like and, and how do you mitigate um, uh, errors along the way, failures along the way maybe. And I'd seen that in the construction industry and that was a, a, another thing that was a turning point in my thinking, but also a turning point in my thinking was um, just, you know, what does a startup think? Do I want to do that myself? Or, hey, look, can I take another perspective and learn a little bit about this? And at that time, we were talking about 2002, a degree came up around a Master of Business Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Yeah, because th this was brand new at the it time, was right? really brand new. Mm -hmm. Your choice at the time was doing an MBA and non nothing against MBAs. It, it serves a purpose of its own. But um, I thought, innovation and entrepreneurship and this is entirely new and at a time that nobody was really talking about these terms in fact I think at the time really innovation was the maybe a bit of a buzzword but entrepreneurship really wasn't because it's you know sometimes there's a connotation there around it being a uh, you know off the back of a truck and use only fools and horses as a as a comedy example of of um, selling things out of the back of a truck maybe yeah. but but um, it's nothing like that of course and uh, from that early you know, 2002, uh, there was a, a conversation starting around this topic of entrepreneurship. So uh, I did a taught master's, so it was 12 subjects around uh, innovation and entrepreneurship of all, all facets of that area, uh, and did a, a stint in Germany at a European Business School uh, looking at inter international business, um, mainly from a European perspective, but it was made up of um, North Americans, Europeans, and a uh, little Kiwi there as well, yeah. and uh, maybe I think there was one Australian. So it was kind of nice to do that, and that was kind of a credit for one of the papers uh, that I was doing for my master's. So that's in a nutshell is where I got to with that the that part of the uh, journey, uh, and it was presenting the final project for that master's, which was more of a research project. I wouldn't call it a thesis or a dissertation or anything like that, but something that was of, of interest. And I was talking to a cousin uh, in, in the wine industry, and uh, he'd said, you know, um, we're looking at combining our forces with other wineries that are family businesses and, you know, cooperating on a, the kind of the marketing function, which is, you think about that, it's quite unusual to compete and kind of work along the same lines 
with with the branding and marketing side of things because you, you could share operations and and uh and you know could bottle somebody else's grapes or you know juice and whatever so that's one thing but to, to on marketing functions another thing so I took upon myself to do a research project around cooperative wine marketing in the wine industry. And, and it just happened to be that it was around family businesses as well. And of course, there's an entrepreneurship, uh, uh, you know, underlying in, in, in that as well, because it's quite entrepreneurial to do something like that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so from there, I had presented this at a conference. Uh, it was an entrepreneurship conference. It just happened to be at, uh, in Auckland at the time. And um, the person that presented before me uh, was the person that ended up being my uh, PhD supervisor. She, her interest was in uh, family business and uh, entrepreneurship. She'd been talking about that. That's what our uh, track that we were talking about um, was on family business as a, as a topic. And uh, here I am talking about this area of family business, uh, entrepreneurship coming into it, of course, um, the wine industry and, and so on. And I guess it sparked in her at the time that, hey, look, we've We've got actually we've got some funding to do some further research in this area, uh, and uh, it ended up developing into what became a, a scholarship with um, the Employers and Manufacturers Association uh, and Bright Futures, as it was then, uh, a a, a, um, a scholarship that would give me uh, a, a leeway to to study a PhD in the area of entrepreneurial family businesses. Uh, and it just happened that uh, wine business was just a nice context to have it in and everybody yeah. was happy with that from a supervision perspective. Yeah, great. So what does the landscape you know, look like in New Zealand from that that perspective of entrepreneurial family businesses? What, um, you know, what, do you, okay. what, do, what do you see? Well, if I can go back a quick step, because when I started my PhD, you know, I, I – we're looking at some context like family business and, and uh, the wine industry and, and entrepreneurship overlaying laying in that. So I guess because this is a family background, the, yeah, this it? is exactly. So the starting yeah. point was actually you know what if I'm going to do a topic on these 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 areas, how do I go about doing that? And I thought, well, you know, I've got this family heritage, and I like the family heritage as a story, and I wasn't involved in the winery personally. Um, we. My, my my mother was, my grandparents were, they were involved uh, intimately with different aspects of the business, uh, whether it's the engineer for the winery or, or um, um, working in the shops or managing the shops that they had in, in the cellar door or whatever it might be, right? But, you know, as a, as a well, I would have been, yeah, I'm fourth generation. We kind of missed out. We were, too, we were younger and, and they'd sold in the mid-70s and, and their decision was around really – do we want to be a transnational business that had finance from uh, elsewhere within the business at the time? Uh, so it wasn't just all family money, money by the, from my recollection, and um, or being a medium-sized family business. Because re remembering at that time, um, Corbyn's was one of the biggest uh, firms in New Zealand alongside the likes of Montana, which had a different business model. Yes. And so they're competing against behemoths in, in, in uh not just in winery, but what, whoever, whoever, whoever were backing them. So um, that decision of, you know, how do we maintain growth um, or how do we maintain it as a family business? I, I guess it's one and the same question. That's, and they that's, decide, yeah. That's interesting, isn't it? Because I, I imagine there will be, you know, a lot of listeners who are, you know, either – yeah, you know, they they own a business with you know family wise, or they work in a, in a you know some sort of leadership role yep. or a key role, um, you know within a business that's that's you know probably juggling, juggling. many of many yep. of these sort of similar uh, similar sorts of challenges, right? Um, you know, there might be a different stage and size and, and scale and so on, but it's it's really quite. Um, you know, key to where and where a business you know gets yep. is those decisions are around whether you just okay we're going to be bootstrapped, family funded, yep. what have you, uh, or actually we're going to bring in that outside funding, which yep. can uh, you know significantly transform you know a business in terms of the potential scale. Yeah. So, and, and so, so what was what did that story look like for Corbyn's? So well, so. Uh, for them, it was ultimately an, an, an exit of the business. And, you know, everybody makes their own decisions about, you know, a family business. It's nice to be passing it on. And they had for a significant period of time. Um, and 
um, you know, anybody can debate whether it was the right or wrong decision and all the rest of it, but maybe it was just the right decision for that time. Um, but, you know, what it suggests is that at that time, if you're thinking about succession would be in the mix at the time, I guess. Um, but also, um, yes, the money side of it and growth. If you want to go for that, uh, that be the largest firm in New Zealand or even just compete, um, maybe you get to a point where you, you need to decide whether uh, how much you're going to dilute your own interest in the business and and um, or exit. So so I guess that's a starting point for for my PhD is like, OK, this is a question about how you, uh, you know, and well, the title was essentially in what ways uh, can entrepreneurial family businesses be sustained across generations? You know, asking that question, what, what, what does that look like? And we know that family businesses, you know, you've got your first generation and it dilutes a little bit in the second generation, you get to the third generation, it's, it's diluted even further. And there are examples of very large, um, or let's say very long, long um, uh, standing family firms in, in parts of Europe and, and Japan is a good example of very old firms there that have been passed on from generation to generation. Right, hundreds of years. Right? Hundreds of years in New Zealand were not necessarily like that. One of the things about the wine industry which makes it interesting is that it was a handful of winemakers in the early 1900s. They're all family businesses. I mean, when they came to to uh, put together the uh, Institute, uh, the New Zealand Institute of Wine, I can't remember the right terminology it was called at the time, but they they were all family businesses essentially. And it's far cry from what it, what it is these days. You know, um, the so the starting point is you know that decision of you know do you sell or do you do you uh, stay as a family business? I guess it was a, an interest to at least get started on a thesis. Mm. And, um, you know, one of the answers uh, that I guess m my contribution through that was looking at the knowledge side within the firm. Now, there were other contributions around, you know, the entrepreneur orientation side and, and, and so on. But, um, you know, what, what does this knowledge thing look like in, in a family business? Because when we Think about the knowledge bases of a senior generation and the next generation, and, and you know you could even extend that to past generations as well. But um, definitely within a, an intergenerational firm, so there's a couple of generations working in the firm, you have different knowledge bases. It may be that you, you, the senior generation are uh, running by the seat of their pants, or the, there's trial and error. Maybe they've got some education behind them, but what they do over time is build up tacit knowledge, right? So with the the younger generation coming in, new education, new experiences in the wine industry, might have done a vintage in France or wherever it might be, and they bring back that knowledge, whether it's around organics or biodynamics or whatever it might be. Um, and if they choose to be with the, uh, we use wine industry as an example here, but you know, uh, come back to the family business, it may be that they want to do something that they're interested in. And also maybe they want the leeway to be entrepreneurial within the firm. And maybe a family business is a good place for seed capital as well, right? So you know, some of the examples I saw was that, uh, that the next generation came into the these, I studied the wine industry and family firms in that industry, right? So when the when the uh, next generation came back to the into the business, they were um, educated, they'd had experiences, they didn't just start because you know, they'd left school and didn't have anything else to do. They'd had other experiences. They may have been picking grapes when they were two years old or whatever it might be sure. as yeah. well. Yep. But it's that kind of idea that they've got new knowledge that they can bring to the firm uh, mixed with that senior senior generation's knowledge as well. Yeah, so it does, so, does, does seem as though there, there is quite commonly that hallmark of, uh, of family businesses that pass from generation to generation. They're not... Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that it's not possible for someone to you know, obviously come into a family business without going out and doing other other things. Yeah. But uh, you know, I've I've certainly you know, uh, you know, I think we probably all have you know seen a lot of that where where a family member, as you say, they might go off overseas, go through varying study, they come back with sort of you know a fresh modern thinking to augment mm -hmm. uh, you know what's there in terms of that existing. Uh, knowledge and 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 experience is that quite essential to the sort of success of the intergenerational um, you know family family business or you know what's what are the what are your other observations around how that how that fits together because I'm sure we you know we've got 
uh, listeners from all you know all sorts yeah. of sort of circumstances, but there certainly will be, uh, as there is at any point in time, uh, there will be you know business owners who are yeah you know, maybe heading towards retirement mm. and or or thinking of that you know a, a decade or or or, or two out mm. and thinking mm. around how they sort of steer through this journey. There'll be others who are a little bit younger. Mm-hmm. And they're thinking around. Well, what's what should what should they do to maybe you know they're maybe not even sure whether they want to be part yeah, of exactly. of, mm-hmm. of family business. Uh, others are maybe a little bit further along and and would like to be. But you know, how do you make that work? There's a sort of I don't know whether it's a wrestling for control uh, so much <laughs> as, as but kind of that 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 sort of journey of. Um, you know, building up the confidence mm. of you know, it might be you know, uh, you know, parents, family members, and so on to to you know take a um, you know a, a bigger role or mm-hmm. to, you know to to step into uh, to to lead a business. It's, you know, there's a lot to work through here, yeah. and I guess yeah. it, it varies in each each circumstance, but there are also a lot of a lot of similarities. Mm. So what, so, what can you share in terms of uh, you know advice for for these different groups well, and, and and what you what you learned through the research? Well, I th- I think that uh, s- stepping back a bit and going okay, well it's not about just the wealth being carried on in the family necessarily. There is that that idea that you you go if you, how how would you entice somebody into into the business or do they need to be enticed? Is there something that you can show that is of interest or like I said before, seed capital for starting up a project on the side that could mm. end up being the bigger part of the business uh, at some other point in time, right? Right. Um, yeah. But also, you know, bring it back to the innovation entrepreneurship side of things. You know, if you've got an entrepreneurial firm, often that's, yes, the founder is likely to be entrepreneurial and, and, they, and they've got a journey of their own, but the next generation coming in, it's almost like, hey, let's have a reset now we've got some new junior entrepreneurs in in the firm, and maybe they they need to make their own stamp in the uh, on on the business as well. So I guess that's that's the bit that you need to stand back and as the senior generation and go, okay, look, we've been doing this this we've been doing it this way for so long. What would it what would it look like going forward? And I'm, I use the uh, the example of uh, country calendar. I mean, New Zealanders know what country calendar is, and and some of us um, watch it from time to time and think, well, every single time, or I, most times, they say this is a family business. The next generation's coming into the business. They often talk about some kind of innovation that's going on within the uh, the business, whether it's a contraption they've built that's within their 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 I don't know the nut growing um, orchard or whatever it might be that's sure. not shared anywhere else, right? Yeah. And they're not commercializing it and so on, but. You know, if you're looking towards the next generation and think, hey, you don't necessarily have to steer them into a certain education or anything like that. That there might be just a natural um, inclination. I always think of a story of a, a psychologist's son who took the, the tapes of his father's um, uh, dog calls. He had tapes that had dog calls in it, and as a psychologist, he put together a um, an app eventually on um, using bone conduction. Uh, you know, um, for uh, sending the signal to the dogs to uh, to to give them directions. Oh, wow. you think well, that's a completely different, you know, <laughs> background to the farming background. And yeah. you think well, you know, I see that in the wine industry. I see, see that could be potentially in lots of industries. And let's let's put a caveat on. I mean, th- th- let's face it. Some businesses, it's not as easy as saying that. You know, another area that I delve into is traditional industries, and and you know, we often think of those as primary industries. You know, our orchards, our Farming, our agriculture, um, also it could be in textiles and manufacturing, those kind of areas as well. But um, maybe these are, uh, it's easier for the next generation to enter into those kind of businesses. And, you know, I, I could talk a lot more about innovation in, in traditional industries, but needless to say, they, they tend to be low tech industries, um, but they often use a lot of high tech. And, uh, you know, it could be um that that, that that that's what the next generation bring to the play the mm. the digital natives is the same might go or they bring technology because they use it from day to day without thinking twice about it the senior generation might be going well i don't need to worry about a computer or even a smartphone um i've always done it this way and and sometimes there can be some path dependent thinking in there it's not that that's negative in any way it's worked for a long time but the next generation can regenerate you know the, the business in some mm, way yeah yeah definitely yeah that, that that's interesting i was speaking at in uh 
Christchurch at a, at a conference last last week, uh, keynote sharing a futurist sort of perspective. And um, yeah, there were there's that 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 whole um, aspect of you know what is bringing bringing that fresh mindset in. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know what can that do? What's the what what change can uh, can that bring? And I think it, you know it's really important to have that. And sometimes that can come through bringing. Uh, Younger people in who are, you know, seeing things through a, through a different set of eyes, mm-hmm. um, you know. But also that can, you know, that can come to be a, be a choice that's made, right? Um, yeah. You know, uh, across a, a leadership or you know team team members. Um, so just sort of pivoting to to you know the work that that you do um, at. AUT Auckland University of Technology. Mm. Um, what sort of people do you see coming through there, and do you see, um, you know, mm. do you see sort of much much crossover with your research in terms of the, you know, the folks that that uh, that come through and yeah. and the opportunities to, uh, uh, you know, I guess you know for, for their their journeys to mm. and, and inspire that sort of forward looking thinking. Yeah, I mean, I've, I kind of frame myself as being, wanting to be a, like a, a, an entrepreneur enabler, an innovator enabler. In the classroom environment, um, and I'm fortunate when the subject of entrepreneurship, there, there's a, 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 um, a, a, I guess a, 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 an agreement between faculties, you know, that means that, that students come from other faculties. It's not just business students. And that's what's exciting. I mean, at the end of the day, you, you don't want to have a whole lot of management, um, you know, marketing students, only in the room. You want to have um, engineers, um, you know, information systems, uh, fashion designers, um, you know, and others in the design area. Um, even you know, I mean, we've had everybody from sports to to uh, psychology and 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 everything, hospitality and everything in between. Mm. So that brings a, a spice to the classroom because then you've got to be on your feet. Now I go back to the construction industry. One thing about the construction industry I really learnt. Um, uh, to navigate was communicating with the client that's fronting up with all the money and talking to those that are that are working on the ground uh, in whatever form that might be. But, you, you know, there's a different communication style for, for those people. They come from different uh, angles. They are either creative or analytical. They, they, they could be all of these different things. And in a classroom where it's quite eclectic, um, you need to think on your feet and think laterally again around what that looks like. So... So from a teaching perspective, um, it, it is about bringing those different ideas, those different types of personalities together and, and getting, getting them to think about what an entrepreneurial mindset is. It's not necessarily to churn out entrepreneurs necessarily, but do they, um, can they understand what an entrepreneur's mindset is? Often, even if you're studying accounting, you're going to be working with entrepreneurs at some point. If you're on the marketing side, you're going to be working with entrepreneurs at some point. You could be the entrepreneur yourself. If you've got technical knowledge around engineering or whatever it might be, it may be that you um, that you that you only want to be on the technical side, but you need to understand that you may need somebody to champion that product or service that you come up with, right? So, uh, so that's the teaching perspective. From a research perspective. It's a it's been a growing um, area of research, uh, innovation, entrepreneurship more broadly. Um, it's always been there. It's been in economics for for eons, but um, you know the actual kind of forming of of the education around entrepreneurship. Um, can you learn entrepreneurship? And you know there's debates on that as well. Um, but but like I say, it's not necessarily about learning to be an entrepreneur, which is is an important thing that we can do, but also can you understand working with entrepreneurs? And I think that's important as well. Mm. But, um, you know, from a research perspective, I've been fortunate to um, have an appointment with the uh, Science for Technological Innovation, which is one of the national science challenges. The national science tra- challenges broadly are uh, challenges that New Zealand uh, think, you know, th- that, that have uh, have meaning for New Zealand's mission going forward. Yep. Um, things like the deep south Antarctica or the old elderly, or the, the young building better homes in cities and, and so on. But the one I'm in was the, the Science for Technological Innovation, and it's looking at, um, at you know, human capacity around skills and so on, and the relational capacity around networking and building, working in teams and, and so on. I mean, there's more, more to that definition than that, but 
broadly speaking, that's really looking at the uh, how do you build New Zealand's innovation capacity, which is something we can all vouch for being important for uh, as a driver of our economy, especially when we're looking at, at mm. technology and um, I guess the driving force of New Zealand uh, is those, you know, we, we, SMEs, um, family businesses, I would add to that because a good majority of them are family businesses. But I'd also like to add, you know, that um, family businesses aren't just small businesses. They're not, you know, some of the biggest firms in New Zealand and, and around the world are family firms or family controlled or family um, managed or governed uh, firms. So mm. uh, we need to look at that more broadly as well. But that's an engine room, engine room, uh, they're an engine room for, for our economy. Mm. So um, going back to the science for technological innovation, that's, that's um, you know, important for um, the, the industries that we have in New Zealand. Um, I was following a robotics team. Uh, looking at the forestry industry and, and I guess it's around the, the health and safety around the um, uh, for forestry workers and how do you get the seedlings up to the, the workers and, and various other things. That's quite generalizable to other industries, of course. Um, you know, using vision, using the algorithms, uh, you know, software that's used, the um, sensors that are used to navigate rough terrain and, and so on. Um, these are important things, not just for the forestry industry, but you know, what's the greater vision here? Is, is there is this generalizable to other spaces as well? And I'll, I'll leave them to to work on that. Um, but it was uh, from my perspective, my job was to follow the robotics team as a social science side, or looking through a business lens at those kind of um, uh, those interactions, you know, the team side, the lean, the leadership side, side, the engagement with various stakeholders, uh, and and so on and so on. So it wasn't building robotics, I'm afraid to say it's not not the tech side, a uh, lot of a uh, lot of jargon that I didn't understand. But um, from my perspective, it was interesting to see how these teams uh, uh, form trust, um, how they um, how they built teams and, and so on. Yeah, great. Now, look, I'm, you know, I'm a big believer in, in you know, leveraging technology and, and innovation mm. for us to, to, you know, drive New Zealand success going going forward. Um, but what have you learned in terms of, you know, the practical, you know, things and how we, you know, how mm. we, we, we apply, um, you know, appropriate thinking? What are, the, what are the changes that we should be making within our, uh, within our organisations to succeed, okay. whether that's the family organisations or, you know, or, or other, uh, you know, entities so that we, you know, that we do better? So I, I guess my bias is towards a, 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 a I'm going to say family firm, but let's mm. think of that as a context. Can that be seen in other contexts? Mm. You no, know, mm. are, are we, you know, like with these science teams, and you know, these are um, teams with um, experts from across the university system. Sometimes Crown Research Institutes and other research, um, private research institutes, and, and and so on, and and other stakeholders, right? Mm. So, are they uh, when they're working in a team like that? Um, they often talk about being a bit like a family, right? And you have your early career researchers that come in uh, at, at the, at, you know, whether it's through their master's or PhD or postdoctorate or whatever it might be, um, and they're working with senior experts, you know, professors, um, people that are not necessarily professors, but people that are experts in their field. So that would be your senior generation, right? So I think if we just broadly generalize that um, using family business as a context of uh, easy to describe and sure. we know what those relationships yeah, are, we're, yeah, yeah. We're, you know, um, do, what does that look like in organizations? You know, when we're looking at the, the younger generation coming through and the senior generation, and again, looking at those knowledge bases, how are they different? Um, you know, using the wine industry as an example, maybe the children have a little bit of tacit knowledge. And when I say tacit knowledge, you know, that kind of stuff that you can't explain, you just do it. And you, you know, they may have been involved in the winery, picking grapes and all that, that kind of thing all the way through their, their, you know, after school or wherever it might be, right. So they may build up a little bit of tacit knowledge there. But it's the explicit knowledge is the, the new learning that they can bring. And um, that's the stuff they can bring in. That happens in other industries as well, right. I mean, you've got your new PhD student or masters or whatever, bringing new knowledge that they've, they've accumulated through um, their university or polytechnic, whatever kind of education they've had, 
and they bring it to the the to the um, the, the ball game, if you want to call it that. And the senior generations uh, got to take a step back and go, okay, actually things are changing in this world. Uh, Technology is changing in this world. These guys are, you know, know how rapidly it's changing, and they adapt very quickly because they're in it. They're, it's, it's their thing. Um, and we need to take note of the, uh, the the younger generation as well. And I think how do how do you marry that up? I mean, I don't have all the answers yet on on that, but I can definitely see, you know, through a, I guess a, a I won't call it a crystal ball, but you can see that the next generation is quite important in the formula for successful organisations. Yeah, yeah, no, I th- I think you're right, and you know, and I I noticed that, you know, running running a, a a firm that's you know works with with technology and innovation and and you know a a role to help our you know clients to move mm-hmm. forward to you know to to leverage leverage technology and to be innovative and to uh, you know get moving at at, at pace and so mm-hmm. on. Um, you know, off even you know for us and in, internally, there's you know there's a lot of uh, you know great you know thinking mm-hmm. and uh, you know approaches that sort of come through as we have new people come into the business. Um, you know, but also in the organisations we we work with, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, you get you get that mix, and mm-hmm. it's uh, it's it's you know I think really uh, really Im- important mm-hmm. uh, that we yeah we don't just sort of lean back into the well we've been doing it this way and you know you're trying oh, well, to trying I mean, to keep things running because i think you know we all we all know and 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 we accept the the reality that things are moving at a sort of you know the fastest pace they they ever have done and and um you know the the probably the the challenges in in uh in business are, are you know really genuine and the disruptive forces mm-hmm. of of technology uh, you know, if an organisation isn't uh, isn't leveraging mm. technology well, then you know, of course, their competitors and and other players in the space, you know, probably are, mm. and uh, and and they get you know they get left behind in one area or another, whether it's you know they they just get disrupted, mm-hmm. or whether they're inefficient and 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 what have you. Um, I'll so, just add there though, you know, nobody's redundant in this this situation you know no, you no. need to have that senior generation you need to have that wisdom uh, mm. and you know the, the decision makers sometimes they they could be called um you know could be called gatekeepers of knowledge or, or whatever you want to call them um but th- but the idea that, that that it's not about them and us necessarily it's how do you share this knowledge around yeah. for innovative outcomes you know we, we we could the innovation come out of all of this um, so I think the formula is kind of you know A plus B rather than kind of like A minus B or B, I should say B, B minus A being a senior generation. It's got nothing to do with that. I think you need to have that wisdom. You need to have the experience um, in the equation, and uh, the newer experience coming in, maybe it needs to be tempered from time to time. We've got to remember that too. Oh, that very things much so. yeah. can speed up too quickly, and we need to think of the social repercussions of. That as much as we do of the excitement of having new technology and um, what that might look like in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's uh, yeah, it's a it's a great point. And look, you know, I guess my um, you know what I like to present is that thought that look, this this futurist mindset is actually you know it's for all of us. Mm-hmm. You know, we all need to be taking you know taking that thinking on board. Now, obviously, we will we'll, you know we vary in terms of how we're wired and and, mm-hmm. and what we can. Uh, what we can bring to the table, but I think it's a, it's you know it's certainly an essential uh, you know element of of leadership mm-hmm. um, and and should sort of spread far and wide across our organisation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's great. Um, so, what else would you would you like to uh, share with uh, with listeners, Paul? Is there any, uh, any other things that sort of you know stand yeah. stand out? Um, well, I mean, one thing that stands out is that. Um, that yeah, with the, you know using family business as a context again is that that um, that getting a bit of understanding of the industries that we're competent in as well. And we 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 um, we want to start new industries. Don't don't get me wrong. We need to have the the high tech in there and so on. But we also need to acknowledge that we're actually really good at some stuff that could have high tech in it, right? Yes. And to some extent, that as our primary industries, our more traditional industries. 
um, whether it's construction, you know, go back to construction again. Sure. There's a lot of innovation going in, on in, in, in that industry, whether it's around the supply side with the kind of materials that are used and um, the designs. We've got the tiny homes coming in there. That's innovative design in itself, right? Mm -hmm. You have to think, think with constraints at that point in time. So uh, I guess it's just thinking about those, uh, you know, what are, what are we good at in New Zealand that we can leverage, that we can be the experts on on the world stage as well, but not also forgetting that um, we need to advance and we need to compete with the world as well. And sometimes that's around the, the, the you know, we've, we've got some examples in New Zealand where we've, we're supplying the world more than we are New Zealand in certain technologies. So um, let's, let's um, keep on moving forward with, with that side of things as well. Yeah, yeah. Look, I think you know we we look at uh, where our technology sector is going, yep. and you know certainly you know the from the likes of the Technology Investment Network, yep. their reports and, yep. and and others sort of showing, you know, look, tech tech is uh, maybe not very far off being our our biggest export earner. Now yep. that's great, yep. but where I see it is at at times within other sectors, you know, our, our non, you know, tech tech firms aren't leveraging technology as at the pace and innovation mm -hmm. at the pace that they should be, mm -hmm. and therefore sort of fall behind. Mm -hmm. So I think it's it is quite important that we, you know, we we look to those, uh, you know, technology firms and and what they do, and mm -hmm. and realize, hold on, we we need to make sure we bring, uh, you know, we bring that through. We marry together the the technology innovation and entrepreneurship sort of mm -hmm. across all sectors mm -hmm. right and that's um uh you know i think uh, essential for us to you know mac maximize the you know the great organizations that mm -hmm. uh, that we have right yeah and you know we've we've i think we we went to the same event uh, the, the manufacturing design and entrepreneurship conference that uh was you know born out of uh, uh university of Auckland's kind of um I think it was innovative materials and oh God, I can't remember. I've been not go there, but but the but the the idea that you're bringing manufacturing, design, and entrepreneurship together in the same forum is something kind of unique. You know, we wouldn't we'd look at those things separately usually. And you know, I know at, at AUT it's similar. You know, you've got a design school that covers uh, the, the the design, the engineering, the manufacturing side of things, brings the business side of it, and and has. Uh, well, they have a lot of on the area of media and so, so on as well. But the but you know these uh, um, bringing together where I'm coming from really is converging um, what might be traditional silos within universities or not even that just um, different industries that uh, never talk to each other. Maybe the magic's where they overlap, right? And I think maybe we just need to uh, look at what that looks like. And I'd say the same with family businesses, or I should say between senior and next generations, whatever the organisation, it's that overlap where the magic, magic's going to happen. How are you sharing that knowledge and, and bringing forth what could be good innovative outcomes or the next entrepreneurial venture uh, out, of, out of an organisation um, when you look at both generations working uh, cohesively together? Yeah. That's excellent, Paul. Um, I think that that's us. Is there anything, any anything else? No, I just in? thank I you we, again. It's been really great. I, I, I thank you again. I mean, I do remember this uh, being around for a while. This podcast, and it's good to see that there's some um, good topic, topics coming up, and there have been good topics, um, and and good to be part of that. Yeah. All right. Well, Dr. Paul Woodfield, thanks for joining the New Zealand Business Podcast, um, and. Uh, yeah, look, great to have everybody uh, listening in. We are now really getting into quite a regular cycle with uh, with episodes. We've been, as Paul says, we've been around for a uh, uh, fair fair number of uh, fair number of years. Sort of coming up, yeah, coming up on uh, on on ten years. Um, worth checking out some of the other shows that we have, such as New Zealand uh, Everyday Investor, This Climate Business, New Zealand Tech Podcast. Uh, so there's a fair few choices if you're looking for. Uh, for something new to uh, to listen uh, listen into, uh, and there will be a fair bit of content coming through um, over the summer season as well. So um, so definitely you know keep uh, keep attuned and look out for for that new content. Um, and just a reminder: the show is brought to you by uh, by Gorilla Technology. Uh, so if uh, if you're needing 
uh, some advice or, or input from a technology service perspective or a cybersecurity perspective, um, then head along to guerrillatechnology.com. Um, Paul, where should people look you up if they're uh, interested in connecting? Are you LinkedIn? So, yeah, or? you can search for me on LinkedIn. I'll be on LinkedIn. Um, you can always look through the university profile as well. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm there. Um, I'm, I exist. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> and you reach all. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. We'll catch you on the next episode of the New Zealand Business Podcast. Cheers.